go into the world. And tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What you need to know right now. A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. Good morning. Praise be to God. Hey, good news, bad news. Good news is Jake's back in the hot seat. So hopefully we'll have, you know, slightly less production problems than we've had in the last week. But nonetheless, we're so grateful to James too, for pitching in. While well, Jake was out, and uh, we'll be catching up with producer Jake uh, at this hour. Praise be to God. But is conservatism, conservatism dead? Is conservatism dead? That's what I wanted to ask. Do you think conservatism, I can't even say the word, is it dead? I mean, Ron DeSantis has now stepped out of the race. We're going to be covering that story. Nikki Haley, does she conserve anything? I'm just curious. Asking for a friend. That's all. But does Donald Trump uh, also conserve anything, really? We're going to talk about that. With Mary Margaret Olahan from the Daily Signal coming up at 30 past. They are very excited to have her on the team. She's going to cover that. Plus, I think I'm going to ask her some questions about the March for Life in D.C. Uh, last week. Were you there? Love to know. But also on the program at 14 past the hour, T.S. Flanders, Timothy Flanders from 1 Peter 5, has an article out listing 13 things Pope Francis has done good. 13 good things to say about the pontificate. Of Pope Francis, I want to cover that with you. And can you guess what would might be the what he considers the greatest of the things coming out of the Francis Pontificate? I'm going to cover all of that with you and get your take. I'd love to know what you think about that. You can always do that by commenting live on the video feed over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash act. You can find the live video feed linked up there, and you can also get the uh, the links to where we comment. Just right underneath, just click on one of those icons, and you can start commenting away. Of course. If you're on the inside, then you get access to the Telegram group, which you can find, again, at the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Join the inside. We'd love to have you there. Let's pray. Let's begin. So much to cover today. Feel free to comment. Let us know what you think. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that anyone who fled to thy protection implored thy help or sought thine intercession was left unaided inspired by this confidence i fly unto thee o virgin of virgins my mother to thee do i come before thee i stand sinful and sorrowful o mother of the word incarnate despise not my petitions but in thy mercy hear and answer me amen in the name of the father the son and the holy ghost and now your saint of the day saint vincent St. Vincent the Deacon, pray for us. Vincent was born in Spain in the 3rd century. He became a deacon under Bishop St. Valerius of Saragossa and was serving in that role when he and his bishop were apprehended soon after the start of the infamous Diocletian persecution. The Roman governor held him in prison for some time before banishing St. Valerius and then set about trying to break St. Vincent. The holy deacon was stretched on the rack and his flesh torn gruesomely with hooks. But Vincent was an image of peace and calm, strengthened by heavenly endurance. He was then placed on a barbed gridiron and horribly burned, but the deacon was unmoved by the pain and only increased in joy and fortitude. The frustrated governor ordered Vincent thrown back into prison, where he was comforted by angels to the point of standing upright to praise God. The jailer, shocked at the sight, was converted on the spot, and the governor, now at his wit's end, allowed Vincent's fellow Christians to tend to the deacon. As soon as they placed him on a comfortable bed, however, he happily expired. His body, thrown first into a marsh by the authorities, was defended from beasts by a raven, and then miraculously recovered by Christians after it was cast into the sea. Vincent is a patron of winemakers and cellars, deacons and sailors, and is regarded as the proto-martyr of Spain. St. Vincent the Deacon, pray for us. And now your headline news. The New York Post reports Biden finally admits border isn't secure, believes massive changes are needed. Hey, welcome to the party. 
Hey, during his speech, the 81-year-old Biden said he hoped for Senate negotiators to announce a compromise next week on a border policy as a part of a broader $106 billion supplemental spending bill request that would also finance military aid for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Yes, of course it does. Anyway, he goes on to say, quote, I believe we need significant policy changes at the border, including changes in our asylum system to ensure that we have the authorities that we need to control the border. I'm ready to act, close quote, the president said. However, current administration policy allows nearly all migrants who illegally cross the border to enter the U.S. to await backlogged asylum proceedings, entitling them to work permits after initially waiting a short period. College U.S., what if we spent all $106 billion on border security? What would happen then? Just asking for a friend. Hey, the Blaze reports Alec Baldwin is being charged with involuntary manslaughter after initial charges were dropped over the movie set shooting. A grand jury indicted Alec Baldwin for previous after previous charges were dropped back in April. The gunshot wounded and killed Helena Hutchins, a 42-year-old cinematographer who was working on the movie set in Santa Fe, New Mexico back in 2021. Director Joel Souza was also wounded, but only superficially. Investigators said in October of 21 that a crew member had told them that he failed to check all of the rounds in the gun before it was handed to the actor to rehearse the scene. Prosecutors said they have received a new analysis of the gun, stating that the trigger must have been pulled or depressed to fire the weapon, which contradicts Baldwin's claim. And Ground News reports North Carolina school ditches bathroom mirrors to prevent students from recording TikTok videos during class. Southern Middle School in North Carolina removed mirrors from bathrooms after students were using them during their bathroom breaks to produce TikTok videos causing distractions. The school also implemented a digital hall pass system to track students and minimize disruptions. TikTok now has over 1 billion monthly active users. 32.5% of American users are aged 10 through 19. Those, those are your your headline news. And the gospel today comes to us from Mark chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. The scribes who had come from Jerusalem said of Jesus, He is possessed by Beelzebul. And by the prince of demons, he drives out demons. Summoning them, he began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. That is the end of him. But no one can enter a strong man's house to plunder his property unless he first ties up that strong man. Then he can plunder his house. Amen, I say to you, all sins and blasphemies that people utter will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Ghost will never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an everlasting sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Theophilicet, a an 11th century archbishop, said, The meaning of the example is this. The devil is the strong man. His goods are the men into whom he is received. Unless, therefore, a man first conquers the devil, how can, the, how can he deprive him of his goods, that is, of the men whom he has possessed? So also I who spoil his goods, that is, free men from suffering by his possession, first spoil the devils and vanquish them, and am their enemy. How then can ye say that I have Beelzebul, Beelzebub, and that being the friend of the devils? I cast them out. So it's very clear that the Lord has come to pave the way to free us from the tyranny of the demons. And we are the possessions, the prized possessions of said demons. 
The Venerable Bede, St. Bede, a, uh, he's a priest and a monk from the 8th century. He would say, the Lord has also bound the strong man, that is the devil, which means he has restrained him from seducing the elect and entering into his house, the world. He has spoiled his house and his goods, that is men, because he has snatched them from the snares of the devil and has united them, his church. Or he has spoiled his house because the four parts of the world over which the old enemy had sway, he has distributed to the apostles and their successors that they may convert the people the way to the way of life. You know what I find fascinating about that? Because, you know, I covered this in my documentary film, The Secret of the Saints in the End Times. I showed the parallels between the prophecies of Daniel, Daniel 2, Daniel 9, for instance, Daniel 12, and uh, you can see the same parallels in the very last letter that St. Peter wrote before he was martyred for the faith. You can also see the remnants of that very same parallel in the very last letter that St. Paul also wrote in his, uh, before he was martyred for the faith, both of them being martyred on the same day in 67 AD. You see this prophecy in Daniel that the kingdom will be taken away and given over to the saints. Rome was very specifically that, but I think it's being hinted at here in Venerable Bede's commentary, taken from the devils more and more importantly, and given over to the saints. But the flip side of that same coin, something I also talk about with uh, the expert uh, in uh, the expert in our film, which is Joshua Charles, is that the very flip side, the other prophecy in Daniel is at the end times, the saints will fail to defend truth itself and teach that truth and hold that up, and then. Guess what? Guess what happens? Those demons, those devils, the world comes back in a mad rush to take back what they once owned. Let that sink in. We'll be right back. Here at the Station of the Cross, we proudly bring the truths of the Catholic faith to countless listeners through radio and mobile devices, and we're grateful for the feedback we've received. Catholic Radio has just been a lifesaver for me. I start my day with it. I listen to it all day long as much as I can. There's always people calling in with people who've lost children, and I love everyone has to say and the advice of the Catholic Church and how to deal with suffering. It has given me the strength to get through the day and to get out of bed each morning. I am very grateful. Grateful for it. Catholic Radio to me has been very informative on my religion. It has informed me of many things that I wasn't aware of or should have been aware of, and I've enjoyed it very much listening to it. If you've been blessed by listening to the Station of the Cross, let us know. Call 1 877 888 6279, extension 112, then share your testimonial with us. to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, you know, uh, Buffalo weather last week was not great. Okay. It was not great at all. And apparently neither was the Bills Kansas City Chiefs game because, um, yeah, sadly, I think they lost. You know, poor producer Jake. Jake, how you feeling, buddy? Is it, was it the fact that the Bills lost that made you feel so bad? Or, I mean, do you like, hmm, how, how are you feeling right now, Jake? Well, like I said this morning, uh, I'd say mm-hmm. good enough for government work, but mm-hmm. if I worked for the government, I probably wouldn't be in still. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my deepest condolences to the Buffalo Bills uh, for yeah, losing it's against par the for the Kansas course. City we're, we're used to it at this point. Heartbreaking, yeah. heartbreaking <laughs> missed field goals. That's just part of Buffalo life. <laughs> it's like the snow. You know, yeah, you mm-hmm. get you get you know mm-hmm. five feet of snow in, in yeah. less than five days. That happens. It's just it, it does. It happens. Can anything good come out of Kansas City? That's the next question. I'm not so sure. But nonetheless, hey, speaking of good things coming up, Mary Margaret Olihan is going to be coming up. She is a uh, a senior reporter with The Daily Signal. She covers a lot of the, the headlines. We're going to be talking about the death of conservatism in the West. It seems like it's dead to me. Um, transgender ideologies that are basically... I mean, that's just on the Republican platforms, not even on the Democrat ones. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just what's left. I don't know, but we're going to ask her that. Plus, she attended the March for Life in Washington, D.C. We'll get her take on that. 
coming up at 30 past the hour. Do join us if you can. But here is an article that I found really incredible out of 1 Peter 5. Timothy Flanders. Um, Timothy Flanders. I've interviewed Timothy in my past. He's hard to get because of the schedule. A great guy, by the way. Um, and he's got a series of articles over at 1peter5.com. We're going to be linking to them. You can, uh, you'll be able to find the show notes at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Producer Jake will put those up at the top of the hour. But this, this article is called 13 Good Things Pope Francis Has Done. 13. He came up with 13 things. Uh, this is coming to us after, uh, the, the articles in the series, uh, titles like The Third Pornocracy, The Current Crisis in the Church. Pornocracy in the coming reign of Antichrist, good out of evil papal corruption, and Pope Francis, worst pope in history. Uh, the, this this the current article is in the same series of those. Again, we'll link to them uh, in the show notes. Thirteen good things Pope Francis has done, and you won't guess what he considers to be the best of the best of the good things out of this current pontificate. Want to get your take on that? Please do feel free to comment. And again, find find the ways to comment on the on the uh, homepage there, stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Just under the live video player, you'll see the icons and whatnot. All right, so I'm going to go through these. I'm going to go through them rather quickly. You can read the details of them for sure. Coming in at number one, and I don't know because I'm okay. The best is being saved for last. Let me just say it that way. The best is definitely being saved for last. Coming in at number one on the list, more Marian feast days. So this is good. The first good thing he says that Pope Francis has done to is institute the feast of Mary, mother of the church, on the Monday of the Pentecost octave. This helps to restore something of the Pentecost octave, just as St. John Paul II restored the Pentecost vigil suppressed by Pius XII. Very interesting, isn't it? He says, but the spirituality of Our Lady as mother of the church has far-reaching implications at a time when the church is in crisis. Yay, and amen. More Marian feast days. Okay, I'm all for it. How about a little co-redemptrix? I'm, uh, anyone? Anyone? I'm up for it. Maybe we can put in a good word. Coming in at number two, the year of St. Joseph. You guys remember the year of St. Joseph? Raise your hand if you did the consecration to St. Joseph. Uh, our family did. We went through uh, the book. Uh, of course, and this uh, Father Calloway's book. Did you guys go through Father Calloway's book? I've interviewed Father Calloway on a number of occasions. It's been a while since I've had him on. Maybe I can reach out to him again. But he sort of abandoned all social media, so I'm not sure if he'll be back. But uh, we went through that, and that was a good year. I'm, I was glad for that year. And that is listed as the number two good thing out of the current pontificate was a year of St. Joseph. Number three, strong rhetoric against child murder. Yeah. I'm up for this. I, I like this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking this is a good thing. He says, for the rhetoric of the Holy Father has been strong against child murder, likening it to, quote, hiring a hitman to solve a problem, close quote. This is very powerful imagery and truly condemns child murder with the utmost severity, as is fitting. In Laudato Si, Timothy says, he also numbers the unborn among the poor and vulnerable humans that should be protected, cutting against the Marxist abuse of the poor for child murder as well. He goes on to say, Timothy does, it is true that Pope Francis has undermined this stand with other statements or by his relation to those whose practice or promote this evil. But this does not negate the positive effects of this fitting rhetoric. Yeah, so it's kind of talk out of both sides of your mouth a little bit. Strong condemnation of abortion and yet happy to hang out with Jeffrey Sachs, for example, or send letters to Herr Schwab at the World Economic Forum or Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden and many, many others. Um, so very kind of like, what? But I'm do, I am glad he has spoken out in that regard. Now we're coming in at number four, number four on the list. The reorientation of the papacy on behalf of the poor. Okay, okay. He says, uh, but even if the Pope is promoting the poor as a show of piety, nevertheless, he is helping the poor. These are good optics for the world to see what the church stands for. And this always commands respect. Even if the church is judged by her enemies on purely secular grounds, the Roman Catholic Church is the greatest humanitarian organization in history and at the present war and the present world, thus 
there is a great good for souls, even if Pope Francis is making a show of piety here. So in other words, you can't go wrong. You are, in fact, helping the poor, and this is a good thing. And let us never forget that the greatest humanitarian acts ever, thanks to the Catholic Church, universities, soup kitchens, shelters, feeding, clothing, you know, the, the naked, visiting the imprisoned, that's the Catholic Church. Just get out of our way. Give us the ball and get out of the way. That's what I say. Uh, point number five, the promotion of intergenerational communities, particularly with his attention to elderly populations. You know what? Grandma and grandpa have a significant role to play in the lives of their grandchildren. Pope Francis highlighted that. All right. Praise be to God. Number six, measured critique of modernity in Laudato Si. Now, this 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 point, he writes quite a bit on this one point here. Let me just say this. Uh, Timothy Flander says, quote, first of all, the encyclical statements on climate change are minimal and can be disputed for scientific reasons, as with any scientific claim in any papal encyclical. Second, as with strong rhetoric against child murder, this encyclical numbers unborn babies, unborn children among the poorest of the poor made vulnerable by environmental degradation. He says, uh, but again, these positive things about Laudato Si, Laudato si do not take away from the negatives. The encyclical has been used by the globalists to promote their agenda. Yes, it has. Yes, yes, it has. Number seven, coming in at number seven, the consecration of Russia. Ooh, this is like the third, this is like the third rail right here. Do you believe that the consecration to Russia that Pope Francis did was effective was it on par the fact that he mentions ukraine in the same statement does that negate it what are your thoughts let us know but point number seven in this article by timothy flanders says this may prove to be the greatest thing pope francis did in his pontificate according to bishop snyder this was finally the consecration of russia in the words intention and manner that our lady fatima requested if this is true which is a reasonable belief, then Pope Francis's pontificate will be remembered for helping to bring about the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in our time. Do you believe that? Let us know. Moving on to point number eight, promoting peace in Ukraine. Throughout the awful invasion of Ukraine by Russia, Pope Francis has continually been a Pope of Peace. Pope of Peace. Pope of Peace. Nevertheless, as in the example about the poor above, this promotion of peace is what the Pope should be doing, which helps all sides and ultimately promotes a swift end to this awful conflict. You know, and it it uh, there's another point that follows up on there, so I'll wait for that. Point number nine, actually, I, I skipped point number eight. Promoting peace in Ukraine was point number eight. Uh, point number nine, point number nine, the restoration of the traditional or ordination of married men in the Eastern Catholic churches in the United States. He says, uh, due to an unfortunate conflict with the Irish bishops in the United States, Pope Pius X, Pope St. Pius X, ended up forbidding the ordination of married men in the Eastern Rites in the United States. This was an abuse of power, Timothy says, by Pope Pius X. It provoked many thousands to leave the Catholic Church and join the Orthodox in the United States. Pope Francis, he says, reversed this ruling and restored the traditional rites of ordaining married men. Men, that was point number nine. Coming in at number 10, the giving of faculties to the SSPX as a good thing that came out of this this pontificate. He says, Pope Francis has also given wide permissions and faculties to the SSPX, which helps to heal this division and regularize this important society of priests. This is a contradiction. This is in contradiction, of course, to his subsequent actions in Traditionis Custodis, Nevertheless, these are very positive and important, and um, indeed, he says. Point number 11, decrease of protection of the FSSP. Or rather, let me say that again because I said it wrong. Point number 11, decree of protection for the FSSP. Yes, that's a, that's a, that's a good, that's a much better thing. He says, His Holiness also issued a very strong decree of protection for the FSSP, which confirms them in their charism of preserving the ancient Roman rite for the faithful. Again, in contradiction to Traditionis Custodis. Point number 12, canon law against female ordination. Oof. Now, this is interesting, given a story that's in the headlines today, which I'll be reading for you very shortly. Point number 12. 
Pope Francis also approved uh, Latte Sententia, excommunication reserved to the Holy See for anyone who attempts to ordain a woman as well as the woman herself. This is a very severe penalty, as is strong against the overtures for female ordination, including to the diaconate, which have been tacitly promoted by the Vatican. So there's a little bit of talking, talking out of both sides of your mouth here on this issue. On one hand, there's a step forward that we're going to share in the news today. On the other, there's this very strong condemnation. Where is it going to land? I don't know. Maybe more of the same out of this pontificate. But coming in at point number 13, out of the list of 13, but there's a bonus. The greatest is still to come. Point number 13 of the 13 good things we can say about the Pope Francis pontificate. Again, I want to get your take. I'll share some of that in the after show. Is a moderate response to the Israel-Hamas war. Now, this kind of uh, ties into pause at point number eight, promoting peace in the Ukraine. You know, and that is um, we get shuffled into one of two categories. You're either 100 percent for Ukraine or you're 100 percent for Vladimir Putin. You're either 100 percent for Israel or you're 100 percent for the terrorists in Gaza. Whereas uh, we always take that middle ground where truth lies. And uh, no, I'm sorry. The uh, Pope has actually actually called out errors on both sides. But what is the greatest thing that uh, Timothy Flanders says? The greatest thing out of coming out of this current pontificate is the end to hyper uber ultra montanism the false spirit of vatican one in the future the francis pontificate will likely be used as an example to decree or dogmatize a clarification of vatican one which shows the limits of papal infallibility condemning an excessive papalism that has obtained until now This, I believe, will be the greatest good to come out of the evil Francis pontificate, although it might take 500 years for this to come about. So uh, the greatest thing, according to Timothy Flanders, is that there will be limits to the papal authority in the future. Will that be true? I don't know. We'll get your take. But more coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. Ground News reports two U.S. Navy SEALs missing off the coast of Somalia are dead, according to officials. Two missing U.S. Navy SEALs who were attempting to board a vessel suspected of transporting Iranian components for ballistic missiles to Yemen-based Houthi rebels have been declared deceased after a 10-day search. The names of the missing SEALs have not been released and no further information will be provided out of respect for their families. The U.S., Japan and Spain conducted an extensive search spanning over 21,000 miles to locate them. And we are unsure as to the final result. LifeSite News reports Pope Francis institutes female lectors again at the Vatican continuing rupture from Catholic tradition. On January the 21st, Pope Francis initiated or instituted two women as lectors along with seven women and two men as catechists. The individuals heralded from countries such as Jamaica, Brazil, Korea, Chad, Trinidad and Tobago, Bolivia and Germany. The institution of women as lectors and also as acolytes is a modern novelty resulting from Pope Francis's 2021 changes to the church's canon law as outlined in his Moto Proprio Spiritus Domini. A subsequent motto proprio later that same year, Antiquum Ministerium, provided for the formal institution of women as catechists, resulting in the first institution of women in the roles in 2022. And the AP is reporting Ron DeSantis drops out of the 2024 presidential race, endorses Donald Trump. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis suspended his presidential campaign two days before the New New Hampshire primary and endorsed Donald Trump, leaving Nikki Haley as the last remaining challenger for the Republican nomination. DeSantis' campaign struggled due to flawed strategy, a lack of connection with voters, and Trump's stronghold on the party's base. Major donors withdrew their support amid concerns over DeSantis' uncompromising positions. Trump holds a significant lead over Haley in the polls, and a win in New Hampshire could make his nomination all but certain while a loss in her home state of South Carolina would likely doom Haley's campaign. And those, those are your 
headline news. Praise be to God. Hey, Mary Margaret Olihan is uh, expected to join us any moment now when we get her on. We'll, we're going to jump into some stories out of the headlines, especially Ron DeSantis. Do you think anything left of the conservative party is out there? I mean, golly gee whiz. Um, one of the part of the stories is Ron DeSantis's uncompromising beliefs and policies. I mean, if you believe something is true, should you compromise on that just so you can get votes, so you can get elected? That's that's one question in my mind. I mean, Donald Trump compromises on the on the life issues. He definitely compromises on the on the marriage, the traditional marriage issue, hundred um, percent. Is he the best that we might have to offer? Well, that's arguable for sure, a hundred percent in in some ways. But Nikki Haley, she definitely wouldn't uh, she wouldn't commit to. To saying that you, a man and a woman can only be married, that she uh, basically was on the table for just about whatever. So what's left in conservatism in the West? I think that's the conversation I want to have with Mary Margaret. Hopefully she'll join us here and we'll get her on from the Daily Signal. And you're, you're welcome to chime in your thoughts and let us know what you think. Again, the chats are live and open. We'll be covering some of that in the after show, getting your take on it. But there are other stories in the news that I would love to cover for you. And, uh, you know, I, this this whole female ordination is definitely one of those stories. But here's a story that you're probably not going to see. And I want to bring it up for you today. Um, and I'll link to this in the show notes. Apostolic Visitor of Medjugorje to Pope Francis. Now, this is another one of those third rail stories. I mean, I find that you're either 100% for or you're 100% against. Very few people find themselves in the middle when it comes to Medjugorje. I myself am in the middle. I do not believe in the messages or the seers that have come out of Medjugorje, but I I can tell you I I am profoundly awed with the many miracles and the stories of vocations, transformations, reversions, and conversions that have happened from the countless uh, pilgrims who have gone to the site. I can separate those two things. Unfortunately, I think many people can't. But anyway, I want to read this article to you. It's very short, sweet, and uh, I think it's very interesting, and it sort of lends itself to the conversation. Rome, the Daily Bulletin of the Vatican Press Office reports that this morning, the Vatican diplomat Monsignor Aldo Cavalli was received in audience by Pope Francis. Now, Monsignor Cavalli is named by his title and rank, but not by his current duties. The 77-year-old Monsignor Cavalli who comes from Lombardy completed his priestly training at the Roman Seminary and then studied at the Pontifical Lateran University, ordained a priest in 71 for his home diocese of Bergamo. He completed his studies and began training at the Diplomatic A Academy of the Holy See in 1975. I was one years old when he did that. He then joined the diplomatic service in 79, and in 1996, Pope John Paul II appointed him apostolic nuncio and titular archbishop of Vibo, Valencia. Monsignor Cavalli served as nuncio in Chile, Colombia, Malta, and the Netherlands. When he turned 75, Pope Francis appointed him apostolic visitor for Magigoria, specifically the parish there in November of 2021. When Francis was enthroned, he had a very distinct relationship with Magigoria. When he expressed dramatically in a morning sermon in Santa Marta, but in 2017, Cardinal Ernest Simonia, Sim, Simoni, Simoni, I guess how you say that, his official representative at, the, at then the youth festival in uh, Herzegovina, declared that the Pope had changed his mind about Magigoria. In the same year, a few months earlier, Francis had appointed the Polish Archbishop Hoser as his special envoy to Magigori, and shortly afterward issued the Moto Proprio uh, Sanctuarium in Ecclesia. This created the legal basis for converting Magigori, which is not mentioned by name, into an international sanctuary. In 2018, Monsignor Hauser was appointed apostolic visitor by Francis, and the parish of Magigoria was placed directly under the supervision of the Holy See. In 2019, under Vatican control, Francis allowed dioceses and parishes to officially organize pilgrimages to Magigoria since the first reports of Marian apparitions in the Herzegovinian town in the summer of 1981. Pilgrimages had only been possible privately for almost 40 years. 
In April of 2021, Francis allowed the Pontifical Council for promoting the new evangelization to include Magigoria as one of 30 representative shrines in the Papal Prayer Marathon. You know what's interesting about all of those bullet points that I just read to you, and I'll go on in a moment, is that, you know, one thing that I realized in my understanding of, of Magigoria years ago now was that prior to this moment in 2018, the only judgment upon the apparitions there has been from the local bishops. In fact, turns out that that is the, norma- the normal way, the normative way, the ordinary means of investigation on a- an apparition is through the bishop of the local diocese. It doesn't actually happen at the Vatican level. The ordinary means is the bishop investigates, the bishop makes a determination and declares it one way or the other. In the case of Magigore, the all the local bishops that have been there uh, basically said, no, nothing nothing is happening here, don't come. And uh, the local uh, council of bishops before the uh, fall of the uh, Iron Curtain also sort of maintained that position. But there is obviously a, a, a conflict, there's obviously a debate here, so this got turned over in 2018 to the Vatican. That kind of made it very unique in many ways. And then, of course, they opened up, as it said, to pilgrimages, which led many to believe that soon the Vatican would endorse Medjugorje fully. But, of course, as we know, the visions, the visionaries, they keep receiving messages there. So you have to wait until they come to an end before you can fully investigate everything. The article goes on to say these measures were preceded by disciplinary actions against Franciscans and seers, and the retirement of the Magigore critic Monsignor Ratko. I want to uh, Mostar, Ratko Mostar. I'm sure I'm just obliterating this poor man's name, which were intended to normalize the Herzegovonian town. Specifically, this means the suppression of the seers and the messages. Francis put it this way in a conversation book in 2018, quote, it annoys me when they come with the messages. This is Francis speaking, goes on to say, quote, the Virgin is not a post office, close quote. He also said that the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he also said that as Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he had forbidden a prayer meeting with Magigore Seer, but it was held anyway. They knew that I did not agree with it. The novelty, however, was that Francis made it clear that he was, he would differentiate between the messages he rejected and the miracles that nevertheless were performed in Magigori. And because of that one sentence in this article, I guess I could say I would add that to the list of 13 things that, that Timothy Flanders believes are good things that have come out of the Francis pontificate. I think I'd add that. I, I, I agree. I have to say I agree with Pope Francis in this regard. I can compartmentalize. I can set aside the visions, the apparitions, the messages, and the seers and their activity versus those uh, good intentions of pilgrims coming from all over the world. Uh, I can separate that. I am not sure why. I'm not sure why so many people can't separate those things. Even if you believed 100% of all the messages of all the seers, even if you believe those things, why is it you can't seem to 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 see these things can be separated? They don't have to be connected at the hip. One does not have to lead to the other. This is something we talked about in our after show. I think it was on Friday. I shared some personal anecdotal experience that I have uh, in regards to this story. I could do so again, of course. But one of the main aspects is just the sort of the material quality that comes from the visionaries and the seers. The material quality, like rosaries turning to gold, for instance. This is a very materialistic quality. Compare and contrast that to, say, um, St. Bernadette, who spent the rest of her days living a life of poverty in a convent, accepting whatever humiliations God deemed to send her away. Uh, Sister Lucia, you know, she didn't go on to, to live high on the hog, did she? She didn't, she didn't command high stipends to give talks and to guarantee apparitions during those talks. Uh, did she? So there's a clear contrast with the visions and apparitions and seers and the humility and the humble circumstances that surround them uh, as to what's going on in Magigore. There's a clear di- difference there, I think, that stands out to me and, and to my mind. So I find it very fascinating that, that the Pope, 
uh, Pope Francis has basically taken the same position. He separates these two. It goes on, in fact, there is no doubt that many people in Medjugorje were touched by God and found faith and even a spiritual calling. The recognition of at least the first seven apparitions, which seemed imminent in 2017, has not yet materialized. Neither is its establishment as an international sanctuary. The decision lies with Francis. Monsignor Cavalli took up his new position in Medjugorje in February 11th, 2022 going on a year now, succeeding the Polish archbishop who died in the summer of 21 and was the first apostolic visitor of Medjugorje. Monsignor Hauser banned communion in the hand back in 2019. Can I, can, I'm just, can we get that all over the world? Praise be to God, that would be amazing. I would, I would, I'm all for that. Banning communion in the hand, 2019. Make communion on the tongue great again, I say. Anyway, uh, the article goes on to say, nothing was disclosed about the content of today's conversation since Cavalli's only assignment at the moment is that of apostolic visitor to Magigore. It can be concluded that the audience is related to this. In other words, the audience that they had together, he and the Pope, even if it is not presented as such. In short, Pope Francis was informed today about the situation in Magigore. So I find it very interesting because this happened kind of quietly uh, that this senior who's been given this task has come to visit the home office to present something to Pope Francis in regards to Medjugorje. So kinds of kind of mysterious, don't you think? What do they talk about? Don't you want to be a fly on the wall there? Given how how much of a third rail this topic really is, no doubt, no doubt. There are many people who would argue with me and tell me I'm wrong about it. And I respect your your uh, your position in, in that regard. I'm open to the conversation. But it just boggles the mind why so many, it's an all or nothing kind of a deal. This doesn't seem to make rational sense to me. But let me know what your thoughts are. We'll cover some of that, of course, in the after show. Uh, Mary Margaret Olihan was supposed to be on. I'm sorry we missed her. We'll get her back as soon as we can. But more of a Catholic take and your take is coming up next. Don't go anywhere. The Station of the Cross has many ways to keep you informed about our programming. You can view the highlights of our primetime programming schedule or the full 24-7 programming grid at both thestationofthecross.com or the free iCatholic Radio app. Just search under the programming tab. Our website also offers a printable version for your convenience. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and information. And I'm glad to be on with you. Praise be to God. And it's uh, it's Monday. So I guess we have the Monday issues uh, with uh, guest connections and foggy brain and all the rest but nonetheless nonetheless the show must go on and i saw this article out of the epic times again i can't wait for the after show to comment directly with you about that vatican surrenders over blessing gay couples african bishops at forefront of resistance to controversial fiduciary supercons document did the vatican surrender though is my question in my mind and i find it interesting uh when when i see secular reportage of news stories I always have sort of a skepticism on, do they truly understand what's at stake here? James Barcel is the one who's written this article. We'll link to it in the show notes for you over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. It says, just weeks after issuing a controversial document dealing with the topic of blessing homosexual couples, Fiducia Suplicans, on December the 18th, 2023, the Vatican has effectively surrendered in the face of mounting worldwide opposition. It has approved a document issued by the Symposium of Bishops Conferences of Africa and Madagascar dealing, declaring such blessings will not be given anywhere on the continent. You know, okay, right away, right away, Africa did step up. There's no question. But so did a bunch of other bishops and priests all over the planet. I find it interesting on one hand, we're sort of only talking about the African bishops. And there's a caveat there that I pointed out last week. I'll, I'll bring it up here again in a second. But let's not forget. I mean, there was a there was a split in Spain. Did you see all these Spanish priests are like, nope. And then a cardinal was like, you got to do it no matter what. 
And then another bishop was like, we're not doing it. So, I mean, this is causing major division within Holy Mother Church. Something we talked to Father Gerald Murray about last week. The video went viral on the channel. The, the article goes on to say the African bishop's document titled No Blessings for Homosexual Couples in the African Churches. Synthesis of the responses from the African Episcopal Conference to the Declaration of Fiducia Supicans was issued January the 11th, 2024. Begins by noting that the Vatican Declaration has caused a shockwave. Sown misconceptions and unrest in the minds of many lay faithful consecrated persons, members of religious orders, and even pastors and aroused strong reactions. I mean, have you heard it yet from your non-Catholic friends and family members, your co-workers? Like, hey, man, what in the world is your Pope doing? I mean, for crying out loud. What is you, your friends do talk like that, right? Or is that is that just mine? Anyway, the article goes on to say it does it does this to take advantage of the letter of Fiducia Supicans in order to repudiate the Vatican's document a uh, document's spirit. What Fiducia Supicans strictly says boils down to the idea that if two, at, if two people ask a blessing for what the church church considers a good purpose, that is, if they were severely injured in a car crash and God is being asked to help them recover. They can receive it regardless of whether they are in a relationship of which the church disapproves. The wording is crafted to suggest an indulgent view of homosexual unions. More than that, Fiducia Supicans was a sort of culmination of Pope Francis's efforts to put into practice a policy suggested by his ally, Cardinal Walter Casper, at a consistory of the full College of Cardinals in February 2024, that of tolerating divisions or deviations from Catholic sexual morality in practice without approving them in theory. Eight months after Cardinal Casper's view was rejected by his fellow cardinals at this consistory, he and the Pope attempted to have it accepted by a synod of bishops putatively focused on pastoral challenges with the family in the context of evangelization. That's one of the things I dislike about all of these documents and even the conversation that surrounds the documents. It's a, there's a lot of gobbledygook like language that goes on. I mean, don't you think that, uh, you know, in the Marine Corps, we used to have a phrase and I'm sure everybody in the military had this phrase kiss, right? Keep it, keep it simple, stupid. Like you talk, you talk in the most simplified possible way. And this is one of the things I loved about Benedict the 16th after trying to read JP2's love and responsibility in your mind starts to contort in ways that it wasn't designed to do. And you have to read it 10 times before it starts to make any sense whatsoever. I mean, modern encyclicals these days, it's just filled with jargon. Like, who's writing these things? It's like, did you get some intern out of the United Nations? Did you get the guy that come over from the World Health Organization or the WEF who could write this gobbledygook for press releases to come and hang out and write the Vatican? I mean, what is going on here? Just keep it as simple and as straightforward as you possibly can. The law of subsidiarity. You keep it at the lowest possible level. There's no need to complicate things. There just isn't. And here we go with documents that continue to say things that seem to allow the reader to interpret it in the way that they want to interpret it, right? This document teaches heresy. This document doesn't teach heresy. Um, I'm not a cardinal of the church. I, I'm not ordained. I'm not even all that smart. How am I supposed to determine uh, which cardinals to believe and which ones not to believe? Doesn't that strike you as odd? Doesn't that strike you as funny? The very fact that we see cardinal against cardinal under this issue, Akita, anyone, anyone, um, should be a red flag in the minds of all la- laity. We have got to stop pretending that there aren't bad problems in the church. We've got to. You just got to. This is a problem. You might argue, but Joe, but Joe, come on now. Pope Francis he has a good intention. He just wants to, he wants to encounter people in sinful situations. And then, you know, plant a seed, bless them. Okay, so the document, does the document say when you encounter these people in these irregular unions, like say a woman who wants to marry her dog, for instance, I would argue that's an irregular union, let alone a man and a man, a woman and a woman, a man and three wives, a wife and three husbands, a man and his daughter, a daughter, a, a sister and her brother. I mean, 
you a divorced man and a divorced woman there's lots of situations that are irregular unions which aren't stipulated in the document so pandora's box has been opened here yeah i mean there's a lot of explicit language like you can't you can't actually say that this is a marriage there can't be the pomp and the circumstance that's true but the ambiguity is such that it leaves wide the interpretation and clearly we have seen many are interpreting this as Pandora's box as a way to bless and endorse and agree to and embrace irregular unions of all shapes and sizes. The document becomes the weapon of ambiguity. And that is a problem. That is a clear problem. You don't have to be St. Thomas Aquinas. You don't got to be Dr. Taylor Marshall or Michael Lofton or anybody in between. You can just go, hey, there's a problem here. This is definitely a problem. So here's the question. Why, don't, why doesn't the document get recanted? Why doesn't it get uh, nullified? Why doesn't they, they pull this thing off the shelves and they say, you know what? Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. We're going we're gonna to take this down. Maybe we're going to redo it. Maybe we're going to put out a bigger encyclical. You know, maybe we're going to clarify some things here. But clearly this has caused major problems, major divisions within the church. But here's the, the caveat that I have with the, with the African bishops. I did bring this up with Father Gerald Murray last week. And again, I want your take on all of this. So you're going to be chiming in on the after show here in just a few minutes as we stay on the live video feed. The, the African bishops basically said, well, for our situation, for our way of life, for our culture, for our traditions, for our situation, we, we could never do this. Are you insinuating then that it's not okay for your culture, but it is okay for mine? That's bizarre. That is literally bizarre. It is either right or it is wrong. It is either true or it is false. If it is okay in my culture, then it should be okay in yours. If it is not okay in yours, then it ought not to be okay in mine. Something is either true or or not, this is natural law we're talking about. And as St. Paul clearly teaches in Romans 1, when it comes to irregular unions, it is natural law. And we must hold the ground for traditional marriage between a man and a woman. There must be no compromise. We shouldn't compromise in our elected officials. We shouldn't compromise in our priests or pastors or bishops. We shouldn't compromise the Vatican. And we shouldn't compromise in your own backyard and in your own house. Let there be no compromise. Let us conserve what is truly conservative.